Hello, and welcome to part three of the beginning of the end. Uh, this lecture is probably going to be a little long. Um, mostly, I have to probably cover a little more detail than I did with terrestrial ecosystems because we don't live in them. Uh, so g people generally know less about aquatic ecosystems, um, and they're super diverse. Uh... Yeah, uh, and they're cool. Um, this is a picture of one of my friends, Alexis Weinig, Dr. Alexis Weinig, as of two days ago. Uh, she was and is a graduate student at Temple that studies deep sea marine corals. And this is a picture of her being, I think it's her inside there, Either way, this is, uh, she goes on these research cruises to study deep sea corals, and I think that's her inside that deep sea submersible being lowered into the water. So cool. Anyway, um, there are other learning goals that I have for this lecture, uh, so make sure to pull those up and follow along. But uh, this is going to kind of follow the same format as the terrestrial ecosystems. Um, I may... I will likely cover most of these six points that I would like you to be able to recall for each of the different ecosystems we're going to go through, um, but I may not cover all of them, so it just will require a little bit of like reading through your textbook or Googling stuff on your part. Um, and you can always run by your answers by me before the final, before the final exam, which is just the last exam, not cumulative. Okay. So let's talk about the types of aquatic ecosystems. Uh, you can have freshwater, or you can have marine saltwater. Um, freshwater are classified based on their water flow and depth. You can have lotic or flowing water freshwater systems. These are rivers and streams. And then you can have lentic, non-flowing water, which are ponds, lakes, and inland wetlands. And then for marine or saltwater environments, you can have coastal or open water. We're not going to go into a lot of detail on intertidal areas right now because we'll cover that when we talk about wetlands in the next lecture. And here's some pictures. Those are the Great Lakes. They're huge. And they're so big they kind of behave uh, like ocean systems. There's a pretty river. I can't remember if I took this picture in Yosemite or not. I think maybe, maybe I did. I can't remember. There's a coastal next to the ocean. So let's first talk about lakes and ponds. Uh, this, oh, this is, I remember what this is. This is a picture of a very famous pond, Walden Pond, uh, which I would have quizzed you about if we had been doing this in, per in person, but this is where uh, Henry David Thoreau lived and wrote Walden Pond is here. In Massachusetts, these are the Great Lakes. Uh, like I said, they're so large, they kind of behave like oceans in some parts of them. And then this is one of my favorite lakes. This is Mono Lake, um, which is a highly alkaline lake that has weird alkali flies and other weird stuff that lives around it. It's super cool in California, and you should visit it. Um, but let's talk about lakes in general. They vary in depth, uh, lakes and ponds. They vary in depth from one meter to more than 2,000 meters, so super deep. Um, they vary in size from less than a hectare. I think Walden Pond might be bigger than that, to thousands of square kilometers. Um, ponds tend to be shallow enough that rooted plants can grow at the bottom, so they're shallow enough that light can penetrate all the way to the bottom so that plants can do photosynthesis. Some lakes are so large, like I said, they mimic marine environments like the Great Lakes. Um, most of them have outlets, uh, outlet streams or rivers, and ponds generally sometimes can be ephemeral, which means they are there one season and maybe not the next because they dry up. Um, major events on earth are what shape lakes. So um, shifts in earth's crust creating depressions, uh, glacial erosion and decomposition, 
damming of streams and quarries and surface mines are just some examples of events that can shape lakes. Uh, this, oh, I forgot to mention Mono Lake is a high mountain lake, which is very unusual, and it is not man-made. Uh, it is made from glacial erosion, I think. No, I can't remember. Dang it! Okay, hopefully none of my friends <laughs> watch this video. Okay, uh, so let's talk a little bit about stratification in lakes and ponds. Uh, you can have the littoral zone. This is, uh, in this pic from your textbook, this is shallow water light can penetrate all the way to the bottom in the littoral zone. So you, this is where you can get rooted plants, right? Because you need light penetration for photosynthesis. Then you have the limnetic zone. This is the open water part of a lake and or pond. Uh, extends this it can extend to the depth of light penetration so limnetic zone is also the photic layer that we've talked about before um so this is the euphotic zone the limnetic zone is also the euphotic zone in the open water and in here you've got things living like phytoplankton zooplankton that eat those phytoplankton and other free living organisms like fish um, and then you can have the the profundal zone, and so this is all going to vary on the depth of the body of water. You can have the profundal zone, which is the aphotic zone, because it's beyond the depth of effective light penetration, so you're not getting photosynthetic organisms down here. Um, and this profundal zone, its productivity depends on all the falling organic material from the limnetic zone for energy. So we talked about that in the decomposition and nutrient cycling lecture. And then you have the benthic zone. Um, this is the, the primary site of decomposition. Um, and that's just the bottom. Yeah. Uh, aquatic life tends to be most abundant and richest in shallow waters um, because you can also have photosynthetic organisms there. Um, in terms of plants that can live in lakes and ponds, these are just a few examples of different types of species that you can see along the edge of lakes and ponds. Um, you can have emerged plants. Uh, these are things like sedges. Um, the roots are going to be anchored in the mud at the bottom and then the lower stems are immersed in water, um, and then the upper stems and leaves are above the water. So cattails are an, a good example of an emerged plant. You can have floating plants um, that have root systems below the water surface, and then usually their photosynthetic tissues grow above it um, and extend out. Um, this would include things like pond lilies, duckweed is a really good example of it, um, pond weed, any kind of pond weed that floats on the top. And then you can also have submerged plants. So uh, these are plants that all of their tissue is submerged below the water surface. Uh, and we've talked about like uh, photosynthesis and respiration in aquatic plants before. So here you've got muskgrass as an example of a fully submerged plant. Now let's talk about the animals that occur in lakes and ponds, because some of them are super cool. Um, in the littoral zone, which is the photic layer near the shore um, that can have rooted plants in it, uh, this will include things like hydras, snails, protozoans. Um, this is also where you're going to find dragonflies and diving insects. Um, here's a pickerel. Uh, sunfish also live in the littoral zone of lakes and ponds. And then associated with that are their bird predators, um, bird pescivores like herons and blackbirds that feed on fish or maybe the aquatic insects that live in the littoral zone. And then the limnetic zone. Um, because this is open water, this is, like I said before, this is where you're going to have phytoplankton, zooplankton that feed on the phytoplankton. You might also get a few small crustaceans and also fish that live in the limnetic zone. And then in the profundal zone, um, you don't get like a ton of abundance here throughout all the whole season, but 
Um, animal abundance tends to be most abundant there during spring and fall turnover. So when we talked about like the seasonality in nutrient cycling and also in temperature, um, that's when you're going to get the most abundance in the profundal zone. And then in the benthic zone, mostly what you're going to get down there is anaerobic bacteria. Um, when there's more organic material than can be decomposed um, by the anaerobic bacteria down in the benthic zone, then you can get um, a hydrogen sulfide and methane-rich muck that forms. So this is why um, wetlands are stinky is because there's more organic material coming to the bottom than can be de decomposed by the anaerobic bacteria. Uh, there's some muck. And then um, you can also have in the benthic zone um, periphyton or aufwux, A-U-F-W-U-C-H-S. Um, and they're attached to or move on submerged substrate, substrate, but they don't penetrate it. So examples of periphyton and aufwux are things like algae. That's what's growing here on this sna snail. Sorry, I said that funny. Algae, diatoms, cyanobacteria, water moss, sponges, those things are all examples of uh, organisms you can find in the benthic zone. Now let's talk about um, a human-mediated, well, not always, but very strongly mediated by humans, a process in lakes and ponds that can affect the health of a lake and a pond. And that is eutrophication. Hopefully the environmental science majors have heard this term before. Um, this is when inputs from the land enrich nutrients in aquatic systems. So um, lakes and ponds that are usually subject to eutrophication have a very large surface area, usually relative to their depth. So they're shallow and very wide. We'll talk about one example in just a second. They're usually surrounded by nutrient-rich deciduous forest. Uh, so that leaf litter and the nitrogen runoff from that is feeding into it. Or farmland, which has, uh, Sarah talked about this in her NSF GRFP proposal that she wrote. Um, Sarah Maidman, uh, farmland. So artificial nutrients added to farmland can also then leach into aquatic environments and cause eutrophication, uh, which is what's going on in this diagram here. Um, an abundance of nutrients that's flowing into these, um, which can be nitrogen or phosphorus, then when it gets into these aquatic systems, then stimulates really heavy growth of algae um, and other aquatic plants because there's all this nutrient input. Um, so what you have is an increase in photosynthesis occurring on the top, which then leads to increased decomposite, decomposition of those photosynthetic organisms as they die. And then that increased decomp depletes the oxygen supply that's at the bottom layer, um, that's in the deeper parts of the water. And what happens is it then kills off the aerobic life in these layers. So basically oxygen starves. Yeah, look at that. Gross. The fish suffocate and uh, because the, they lose oxygen at the bottom of the lake. It's not good. One of my favorite examples of eutrophication on a massive, ter terrible scale is the Salton Sea. It's one of the largest ecological disasters in the world. And um, I have uploaded a short documentary for you to watch um, about the Sultan Sea uh, on Schoology. And then I also uploaded a longer supplemental documentary that if you have the time, you absolutely should watch. It's free on YouTube and it's narrated by a uh, world famous, amazing weirdo John Waters. So you should absolutely watch it if you have time. Um, Anyway, watch that and then learn about the Sultan Sea. Um, one thing that's happened consequently after the formation and like subsequent death caused by the uh, Sultan Sea is that it's now become a globally significant bird area um, because the 
body of water has um, caught, has resulted in bringing in um, migrating waterfowl um, to the area. So turn from an ecological disaster into a critically important habitat. <laughs> So let's talk about um, different types of nutri nutrients besides eutrophication. You can also have uh, oligotrophy or dystrophy, which are more less caused by human interference. Um, in oligotrophic lakes and or ponds, you have a low surface area to volume ratio, so they can be smaller and very deep. The water tends to be very clear. Um, there may be abundant nitrogen in oligotrophic lakes, but the phosphorus is very highly limited in these. There's a, a low input of nutrients from the surrounding terrestrial ecosystems, and that might be because they're frozen most of the time. Um, there's little organic matter for decomposers, in these lakes so they tend to have higher oxygen content in the hypolimnion which is the lower layer of the lake and the abundance of organisms in these lakes can be low but they can host high diversity because of the higher oxygen content this is um one of my favorite well now i can't oh is this crit no this isn't crater lake no dang it i can't remember the name of this lake but it's up in near tuolumne meadows in yosemite national park and this is a picture i took up there while I was driving up there to see if the snow had melted enough for bumblebees to be up there. Uh, clearly it had not. <laughs> now let's talk about dystrophy uh, or dystrophy. Um, dystrophy in lakes is when organic matter from the land, mainly humic organic matter, stains the water brown. Um, and this occurs on or in contact with peaty substrates that are usually highly acidic so usually there's peat that surrounds the lake or um, coniferous vegetation that will make the soil then very acidic which we talked about when the needles fall those um, anti-freezing compounds that are in the needles then can acidify the soil um, dystrophic lakes tend to have productive littoral zones that dominate most of the lake's metabolism. So the, the edges of these lakes tend to be very, very productive. So that's it for lakes and ponds. Now let's talk about flowing water ecosystems. Let's talk about watersheds. So um, you can have a first order stream. There we go. Oh, so this is, here is the watershed. This is the watershed is defined by this entire system of flowing water ecosystems that comprise it. Uh, within the watershed, you can have a first order stream, which is a small headwater stream with no tributaries. Um, when two streams of the same order join up together, like here, um, the resulting stream is then a higher order. So if these are both first order, the one that they form into then becomes a second order stream. Um, headwater streams are usually first to third order streams. Medium sized streams are usually fourth to sixth. And then rivers are usually greater than sixth because they're big and very fast flowing. Um, flowing water ecosystems will often alternate between two different habitat types of riffles and pools. Riffles are sites of primary production, um, and this is where you have like periphyton and alfuchs dominating, which we talked about before. So this is like stuff that lives on bottom benthic substrates but does not penetrate them. And then in pools, this is where you're going to have that's a site of primary decomp within a uh, flowing water ecosystem. So this is also major sites of carbon dioxide reproduction, and they help maintain a constant supply of bicarbonate in the solution in the water uh, for possible aquatic plants. Now let's talk a little bit about um, the aminals that live in flowing water ecosystems. Um, streamlining is a very common adaptation to flowing water. So this is a, 
um, a morphological feature where things are uh, thin. Um, oh, like this fish. Fish are streamlined, so they, they tend to be... Um, oh, it's not dorsoventrally. They're flattened from the left and the right side. Uh, and then they have kind of like a, a boat shape, right? Boats are streamlined, so they have like a point at the front, and that helps with um, decreasing the amount of frictional resistance in the water. That's why fish are kind of shaped like that, is that they're streamlined to uh, allow them to move faster through the water. You see a lot of streamlining in aquatic organisms. Um, let's talk about the different types of animals that live in aquatic, flowing water ecosystems. You can have shredders. Uh, shredders will fragment the organic particles and they're not actually eating like the, the leaf litter that they're fragmenting. They're eating the bacteria and fungi that are on the surface of the leaf litter, which we talked about before. Um, and these are all diagrams from your textbook. Um, you can have filtering and gathering collectors. These, are, these uh, filter fine particles and fecal matter from shredders. So they're breaking up even smaller particles that the shutters might create. You can have grazers and scrapers. They feed on algae, bacteria, fungi, and organic matter that's collected on rocks and debris. And then you can have gougers, which are associated with woody debris. And they burrow into waterlogged limbs and trunks of fallen trees. And then you have the predators. Um, this, these tend to comprise, at least in flowing water ecosystems, predaceous insect larvae. Um, they also include certain species of fish like sculpin and trout. I know some of y'all, I know at least Zach really likes trout fishing. Um, and I love eating trout. One day I'll learn how to go. F One day. I used to fish a lot, but I don't fish so much anymore. But I like to fish. I should get a fishing license. Anyway, uh... Predators also will feed on terrestrial invertebrates uh, that will fall into the water and meet their doom. So let's talk about the different kinds of organisms that live in these different um, orders of streams. So let's talk first about what kinds of things occur in headwater streams. So these are smaller streams, um, first through third order, like up here. Uh, these environments tend to be very swift, and they tend to be cold because they, um, because they're smaller. They have like usually have a lot of vegetation that shade over them and make them colder areas. So they tend to be in shaded forest regions. They have low primary productivity because of the shade, because of the trees, and they depend really heavily on detritus input from the vegetation on the side. So they depend very heavily on the leaf litter that falls into the streams. So this would be something like Monastery Run, which we sampled and would definitely be like an example of a headwater stream um, because of all the vegetation that's around it. Um, in these headwater streams, shredders and collectors are dominant because they're feeding on the detritus input that's in there. And then the predators tend to be mostly small fish, um, like that cute, those cute rainbow darters that we found in class. Um, yeah, actually, I don't know what they eat. I bet they eat bugs. Um, I should look that up. And then you have medium-sized creeks and rivers. So these are the larger ones. Um, most of the primary production that's occurring in these is by algae and rooted aquatic plants. Uh, so they have more sunlight availability because they're not shaded. Um, in medium-sized creeks, collectors and grazers are dominant. Um, and... In these environments, the predators shift from being cold water species here to warm water species, and this includes like suckers and catfish and things like that. And then in large rivers, big old ones, um, they tend to be deep enough that sediments can actually accumulate at the bottom. Um, so bottom dwelling collectors are really dominant in these environments because there is actually like a, a benthic zone that's created. And then... Um, some dissolved organic material, which we talked about in the decomp lecture, supports uh, small phytoplankton and zooplankton populations. So this is where they start to like become big enough and deep enough that they almost mimic like uh, 
lake or pond environments with dissolved organic material and phytoplankton and zooplankton. So that's flowing water ecosystems. Now let's talk about estuaries. Uh, an estuary is anywhere where fresh water joins salt water, and we'll talk a little bit more about these in the next lecture. Um, and there are two main problems that face organisms that live in estuaries. One is maintaining their position because estuaries tend to have fast flowing water, so they tend to be high order streams that then connect with the ocean. So maintaining an organism's position in there is very important. And also being, adjust, being able to adjust to changes in salinity is also really important because it's a connection of low salinity water, fresh water, with high salinity water, the ocean. Most of the organisms that live in these tend to be benthic because the water flow is going to be lower down there. It's easier to live at the bottom. Most of the animals are small fish and crustaceans. The rates of water movement determine the phytoplankton populations that are going to move in there. So the velocity of the water is going to be really important for determining what kinds of uh, plankton can actually survive in it. And most of the organisms that tend to live in estuaries are marine organisms because the transition from fresh water to salt water is much more physiologically taxing than the transition from salt water to fresh water. So most of the organisms in estuaries tend to be marine. Um, in estuaries, you can also have what are called andromous fish. They live most of their lives in salt water and then they spawn in fresh water. So striped bass and shad are examples of these kinds of fish that live in estuaries. Oysters also are dominant species in estuaries and one way they deal with the velocity in estuary environments is that they attach to hard objects or they form actual so the reefs within the estuary. So this is like an oyster reef. They just attach onto the dead bodies of other oysters that are in the environment. So that's how they maintain position. And then they can also close up their shells to adjust with changes in water availability and changing salinity. Um, Rooted aquatic plants are also dominant in estuaries because um, the roots allow them to deal with the high velocity so they're not just moving all over the place. Um, this includes things like Widian grass, eel grass, um, and these tend to be important food source and breeding grounds. You can see lots of snails on these um, for organisms that live, animals that live in the estuary environments. So Oh, just a mini little lecture on estuaries right here um, because we're going to talk about them more in the wetland lecture. Now let's talk about oceans. Oceans are huge. They occupy 70% of the Earth's surface and there are two main divisions in ocean environments. You can have pelagic, which is the whole body of water, and then you can have benthic, which is the bottom layer of the ocean. Um, and then you can have different provinces um, within pelagic areas. So you can have the neuritic province in a pelagic environment. That's water that overlies the continental shelf. And then you can have an oceanic province, which is water that does not overlay the continental shelf. And then with the, also within pelagic zones, um, you can have within pelagic environments, pelagic oceans, you can have zones, so they're all laid out here. I can't remember if this is from your textbook or not. Um, so you can have the epipelagic or photic surface. This is um, only about a depth of 200 meters. Um, there's really sharp gradients in light, temperature, and salinity up here because it's based on the penetration of light through the surface. You can have the mesopelagic, which is 200 meters below surface to 1,000 meters below the surface of the water. Um, this, there's very little light here. There's even more of a temperature gradient, and there's very little seasonal variation. So you have the most seasonal variation up here because of the light penetration. There's less here because it's more consistent light penetration. Then you have the bathypelagic, which is 1,000 meters to 4,000 meters in depth. 
Here, it's virtually complete darkness except for bioluminescent organisms, which are so cool, and we talk all about them in invert zoology if you want to take that class. There's very low temperatures in here um, and very high pressure um, because of the depth. Um, octopus, sea stars, um, look at that, that viper fish, so cool. Then below that even, you can have the abyssopelagic, that's 4,000 to 6,000 meters in depth. And this is where you have um, anglerfish, so again, you see use of bioluminescence. Um, I don't know what a black swallower is, but it sounds really creepy and cool. Um, and then you have the bottom bottom, like the bottom proper, which is the hadapelagic. So this is 6,000 meters and lower. And in here, this includes things like deep sea trenches and canyons. Um, I've included a video online. Um, we're going to talk about hydrothermal vents in a second, but that's what's in the hadapelagic areas. So you got tube worms, sea cucumbers, and other weird animals that live at the bottom there. So that's the stratification in the oceans. Let's talk a little bit about primary production um, and photosynthetic activity in oceans. The main autotrophs that you get in open ocean water are going to be phytoplankton. And the dominant herbivores in these environments are zooplankton. Autotrophs, obviously, are restricted to the photic layer, so they're restricted to about 200 meters up, um, you know, 0 to 200 meters. Uh, in coastal areas of oceans, you tend to have brown algae and large kelp as the primary autotrophs. And then in open water, obviously, because they can't brute, most of the dominant autotrophs are the phytoplankton. Um, you get more photosynthetic activity and autotrophs at the edges than at mid-ocean, obviously, because of the depth of the water. Um, in warmer waters... With low turbulence, you can sometimes get dinoflagellates. Uh, I think, oh, this is the dinoflagellate that causes red tide, which is like super toxic. Um, so that's an example of one. Um, in regions where you can have upwelling, um, like Arctic waters, you can get diatoms, which are really cool and really pretty. This is not a natural pattern. There is a man named Klaus Kemp who makes art under a microscope out of diatoms he finds and collects in the ocean near his house and you should watch this little documentary about him on that I I put a link to this on Schoology but it's supplemental you don't have to watch it um and then in um temperate and tropical waters you can get uh, nanoplankton Cyo cyanobacteria tend to be the most abundant in these temper temperate and tropical waters and then you can also get these things called coccolithophores, which these are pictures of them here. That's what you get in temperature, temp, temperate and tropical waters. Uh, so like I said in the previous slide, the dominant herbivores of the autotrophs in open oceans are zooplankton. That includes things like copepods. I actually have a lot of copepods in my fish tank. Um... But they're very small, so I can't really, like, take pictures of them. I'd have to put them under the microscope. But I've definitely, like, sampled them out of my tank before. I think most of the ones that are in my fish tank uh, are, like, very closely related to this one, which is um, the group that Plankton from SpongeBob SquarePants is based on. <laughs> uh, fun fact. Um, copepods are um, dominate most of the grazing herbivores in the ocean, and copepods actually are likely to be the most abundant animals in the world. These tiny little dudes that live in my fish tank and live all throughout the ocean might be the most abundant in the world. Um, comb jellies and arrow worms tend to be the carnivores that feed on the copepods and other zooplankton. Um, this is if... If you take invert zoo, well, I guess the last group didn't really get to learn about tenophores because we ran out of time because, you know, the world blew up. Uh, but tenophores are um, bioluminescent comb jellies. They're not jellyfish. They, uh, they're in a different group, all of their own, but they look like jellyfish, and they can bioluminesce, and they're super, super cool. Uh, 
there's this is like a gif of them from the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, arrow worms uh, are also um, carnivores of zooplankton. Okay, let's talk a little more about photosynthesis in open oceans. So, um, bacteria in protists make up about half the biomass of the sea and are responsible for the largest part of energy flow in pelagic systems. So, not only through like cyanobacteria and autotrophic activity, but also because they're really important for nutrient cycling in the ocean. Um, so, photosynthetic nanoflagellates and cyanobacteria. They make up the large part of ocean photosynthesis, and they will secrete photosynthate, so like the byproducts of photosynthesis, photosynthesis in the form of that dissolved organic material that we talked about in decomp, that then the heterotrophic bacteria then use for their um, nutrition. Um, zooplankton are capable of... Um, some control in these environments that they feed on so they can feed on surface phytoplankton at night and then they at dawn they'll move back to deeper waters to avoid predation um, but here's just a, a graph showing uh, nutrient cycling um, within ocean environments and you can see that a lot of these are bacteria and protists that are involved oh and then this is just a did i ask about this on the exam i can't remember anymore but these are just uh, different zooplankton that move throughout the day um, based on light availability uh, and to avoid predation. Now let's talk about the big boys in the ocean. Um, necton is the term for swimming organisms that can move at will in the water column. So this is mostly the big boys. Uh, they'll feed on zooplankton. Um, Sometimes you can have small fish that are fed on by sharks and whales. Um, baleen whales mostly feed on krill, uh, which are larger plankton. Um, sperm whales uh, also are in these environments. So oh, this is a baleen whale. It's got those baleen for filtering out krill. And then um, sperm whales feed on giant squid. These are the big boys, the necton. And then you can have deep sea predators too in the deeper parts of the ocean. Um, deep sea predators tend to be very darkly pigmented. It helps them blend in with the environment. Um, and then they also have very weak bodies because of the um, intense barometric pressure that's at the bottom of the ocean. Like if you've seen the blobfish or an anglerfish when it's brought up to the surface, they kind of look like they melted because... If they had an, a lot of structure to them, they would be crushed in the deep sea environments. A lot of deep sea predators also have um, bioluminescent lures, like that's an anglerfish, this is a squid. Um, sometimes they'll mimic their own prey, which is really cool. A lot of them have extensible jaws, and then they also have expandable abdomens. Deep sea predators are cool and so weird. Um, here's a... If you're really interested in bioluminescence, the BBC made a whole documentary about bioluminescence called Life That Glows, narrated by my boo, David Attenborough. Um, here's a trailer, and then I put a link to the trailer on Schoology, too. Now let's talk about what I think is part of the most interesting part of the ocean, and that's the benthos. Um, so make sure to watch this video about hydrothermal vents that I posted on Schoology, you might be quizzed on it. Um, also, this is a very funny comic from Beatrice the Biologist about uh, nutrient cycling in the bottom of the ocean. Um, the benthic, benthos depends almost entirely on the rain of organic matter that drifts to the bottom of the ocean. You may have heard this call, called marine snow, this drift of organic matter. Um, the benthos can actually support a high diversity of species, particularly for polychaete worms um, and pericarid uh, crustaceans. That's what these are. Um, yeah. Um, the benthic uh, bacteria 
synthesize protein from the dissolved organic material or the marine snow, and then they become a really important food source for other organisms. So the, the main thing that these organisms are feeding on down here is the bacteria that eat the dissolved organic material. Um, this is a Yeti crab, and it uses these hairs all over its arms to um, grow bacteria on them, and then it basically like munches down on the bacteria growing on its furry arms. Um, super cool. They like kind of like I would mimic this for you if we were in class they like hang their arms out over hydrothermic vent vents to like provide nutrition for the chemosynthetic bacteria that grow in their arms and then they like munch on it um so hydrothermal vents i've mentioned them many times what are they um these are um vents that ha spew jets of superheated fluids that heat the surrounding water, and you'll see really great videos of them in this video from Nat Geo. Um, there are lots of unique s species that are associated with these vents, particularly chemosynthetic bacteria. So um, these are bacteria that grow that are autotrophic on the chemicals that come spewing out of these hydrothermic vents. It's just like crazy, um, and then. Most of the diversity revolves around the organisms that then eat these chemosynthetic bacteria. So like yeti crabs, giant clams, mussels, and then other polychaete worms. These tend to be the primary consumers around hydrothermal vents. Now let's talk about coral reefs. Um, there are three types of coral reefs that are all based on their structure. Um, but first, let's talk about what they're made of. Um, coral reefs tend to be composed of the dead skeletal material of one of one or many of the following. So they can be composed of the dead skeletal material of coral, obviously, coralline red algae, green calcareous algae, um, the skeletal material of foraminifera, which are like floating. Um, organisms in the ocean that have calcium carbonate shells that dead skeletal material can fo can form a coral reef and then also um, the dead remains of mollusks they're generally found at depths uh, less than 45 meters because they have a symbiotic relationship with algae which need to be near the surface so they can access sunlight precipitation of calcium is really necessary to form the coral skeleton I have to actually, well, calcium is important for most invertebrates, but I actually have to dose my aquarium every now and again with calcium because I do have a sea fan. That's a type of coral that grows in my aquarium at home, which will come back to campus when I teach invertebrate zoology again. Um, they also tend to have a high water temp uh, and salinity, and the carbon dioxide tends to be low. Um, and like I said earlier, there are three types here. You can have fringing reefs. Um, they grow towards the sea from rocky shores of islands and continents. So here. Um, you can have barrier reefs. These are run parallel to shorelines um, and of continents and islands and they're separated from the land by shallow lagoons. And then you can have atolls, which are rings of coral reefs and islands surrounding a lagoon. Um, and the lagoon is formed, they're for, well, the atolls are formed when a volcanic mountain subsides beneath the surface of the ocean. So those are the three types of coral reefs that you can get. Uh, so, let's talk about corals, since they tend to dominate in coral reefs. Most corals are form sessile colonies that are supported on the tops of dead coral and um, that, that then cease growth when they reach the surface of the water. As we've talked about before, coral have symbiotic relationships with zooanthellae, which are photosynthetically active dinoflagellate algae that live inside the coral cells. Um, so if you've ever tried to like grow a coral in a fish tank, you have to have uh, a photosynthetic 
you have to have sunlight from like a, a, a heat lamp or a sun, a sun lamp, uh, which I have above my aquarium. So I need that mostly so that my little sea fan will grow. Um, and then um, you can also have red and green coralline algae um, and then filamentous algae and bacteria that will also grow on the coral skeleton as those corals die. Um, and coral reefs then the the other organisms that they can support are like mollusks that latch onto them, um, echinoderms, so like sea urchins, sea stars, sea cucumbers that then feed around them, crustaceans, crabs, lobsters, other things, polychaete worms, um, sponges and fish, lots of cool stuff like that. We'll talk a little bit about those kinds of organisms in the le next lecture when we talk about wetland areas. So that's it for this lecture on aquatic ecosystems. Stay tuned to talk about wetland ecosystems. Bye-bye.